right. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Vicki Ronchetti, and I'm joined by Laura Reeves, my good friend who is the podcaster, um, retired professional handler, dog breeder, AKC judge, Pure Dog Talk um, is her baby. And we haven't talked together for a while, so I'm super excited about this. <laughs> well, you're always on the road judging, and I'm always, you know, screwing around doing something. <laughs> um, but what, what we're going to talk time. about today... <laughs> what we're going to talk about today is passing the torch. And this all came about because Laura had mentioned in, I think, a post, uh, maybe a Facebook post about passing the torch. And I was like, oh, my God, let's do a talk about that. Um, and so this is going to be available on her website, maybe on your podcast, probably too, on my oh, podcast. On share, my it. share it on all the way around. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this with Laura and I thought about, well, what if we had other people who are going through the same process? And I'm like, no, let's just I mean, it's a lot and it's a lot of different reasons and a lot of different approaches from a lot of different people. But basically what we're talking about is when you are a breeder and um, you're ready to not be that breeder anymore, usually it's because people start aging out. And, you know, I was just telling Laura before we started recording that I'm very lucky and that I chose a breed that I can have as an old person. <laughs> you know, if I had like, like, I wouldn't even like to me, the breed, the breeds that you have are like for big kids, like they're so active and they're so busy. And it's like, yeah, I don't even feel like qualified to deal with that. So you are Scotia, and that the and it's cow. journal wire hair pointers and yeah. so tell tell us about tell us about that kennel tell us about the evolution of your breed uh, and for you and okay so i got my very very first wire hair pointer journal wire hair pointer when i was about 15. um my parents had had field trial labs the very first purebred dogs born in our house were field trial labs and then my father said get rid of these bleeping horses and I'll buy you any purebred dog you want. And I wanted an English setter that didn't last very long because I'm not an English setter. <laughs> <laughs> I am on the other hand, a wire hair pointer. Um, I'm a little too smart for my own good and I might bite you. <laughs> and as I've gotten older, I have my own chin whiskers. So I mean, it's a thing. <laughs> um, but I absolutely adored the stand up nature, the, the brains, the, the, just everything about the breed. And I, I was not as enamored of the breeds that my parents had chosen. And so wire hairs have been in my life since I was 15 and I will date myself and say that was 40 years ago. Um, and so I went away to college and I got a degree and I did my thing and I worked a job and, and I worked another job and that didn't work out so hot. And then I was right. So, um, my mom had stayed a little bit involved with the wire hairs and she had acquired this little, this little female that um, came down from the cascade line. That was uh, Ray and Lynn Calkins are the, the breeders of these dogs. They, their dogs have been listed in the top 10 of um, top producing sires in the dog show in confirmation in field trials and in hunt tests since the eighties. Wow. And um, the, I, I laugh, <laughs> parents are both passed away now. And I informed Ray and Lynn after they were gone that I was adopting them as my parents. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so my first wire hair back in the eighties was bred to their first wire hair. And fast forward many years later, this uh, foundation bitch that my mom sent me was down from one of their top dual champions. And so I've moved forward with that. And I have now, um, I think we're at eight generations of um, direct um, bitch line down from that foundation bitch. Wow. And um, we have, I, I haven't counted in a while. I don't really do a very good job keeping track of this kind of stuff. I'm not a really good, you know, ribbon counter. I'm not very good at it, but I know that we have well over a um, hundred titles on dogs ranging from show champion, grand champion, grand champion, all the who daddies, um, 
tracking titles. We have a Mach 5. We have a dual champion. We have a champion, versatile champion in the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association, which is a different registry. So the the sort of branding, if you will, of, of the Scotia Kennel on my website, on my Facebook page is versatility defined. And, mm -hmm. and that is, it's, it's versatile. Not, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not just that they're versatile hunting dogs. So we talk about the continental versatile hunting dogs, which is wire hair, short hairs, fichlas, weimaraners, griffons, right? All this group of the continental hunting dogs that the, the people in their countries wanted to do a variety of jobs. So the wire hair pointer was designed originally in the late 1800s by the Germans who already had all these other hunting dogs. They wanted that Uber dog, right? That dog that mm -hmm. could literally do everything. And so wire hairs were originally designed to hunt fur and feather, to dispatch small predators up to and including a fox, to retrieve on land and in water, to Jesus. guard hard home, and to follow blood trails, okay? So this is a dog that literally was designed to do all the things. And if you don't do all the things with them, they get really bored and they will come up yeah. with all the things to do all by themselves. And mm -hmm. I promise you, I will not like them. And I will, I will die with a wire hair at my feet, 100%. But as I have gotten older, my health, isn't as great. My body isn't as great. And my time is more limited. I find that I am not able to do all the things with my dogs. And this mm -hmm. is a breed that serves to do all the things. And one of the things that I have felt very, very strongly about is breeding a dual purpose dog. And so a dog that is not only good looking, but also good working. And, and good working, I mean, in the field, doing its original job, hunting birds. And I have all the dogs with all the titles to prove it. And I am not in a position to do that anymore. I cannot personally take my dogs and do the field work with them. Did you and used to do that? Did you used to hunt with them? Yeah, absolutely. I grew up. And in did you hunting. learn to hunt with, did you learn to hunt with your father? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you my know, my dad, dad was a hunter too. My dad he, took me hunting. Was... I shot my first gun when I was like seven. Like I always uh -huh. went hunting with my dad. I went deer hunting. So one of my earliest memories is deer hunting with my dad and he shot the deer and I was patting it. And I'm like, you know, five, four. And my dad's giving me the entire conservation hunting lesson because, uh -huh. you know, why not? Because I'm four. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> right. right. And so, no, I grew up hunting. And when my dad said, get rid of all the, get rid of the bleeping horses, I'll buy you any purebred dog you want. He caveated with that with it has to be a hunting dog because what i really actually wanted was an akita and i got one many mm -hmm. many many years later um and no had to be a hunting dog <laughs> and so i am quite possibly within the realm of reason uh, almost assuredly the only confirmation dog show judge you know who has trained sporting dogs to compete in spaniel retriever and pointing breed field events from the time i was a kid and that's how I spent my childhood and my dad didn't want me to work after school and he wanted me to concentrate on my studies and so he would pay me minimum wage to teach the labs the field trial labs blind retrieves and the clumbers how to swim because mostly they sink and <laughs> <laughs> the wire hairs how to retrieve to hand because mostly they don't want to retrieve they just want to eat it <laughs> Um, so that's, that is my background and, and what matters to me in my breed is that they are not just pretty and they're not just running to hear the wind blow through their ears. I spent six years in Nebraska riding horseback field trials for pointing breeds. Um, and I loved every minute of it, but that's not the only thing this breed should be able to do. Mm -hmm. so. So when we talk about like passing the torch, I mean, it seems ridiculous. Some of the questions I have, but it's like, we need to talk about why this needs to happen. Obviously you've invested so many years and your heart and soul into this breed that it would be a shame if you just went, you know, seal it up. We're done. We're, and you've chosen not to do that. And you've really consciously chosen not to do that. You know what I, I mean? I consciously chose not to do that. 
for, for a variety of reasons. Number one, and we were having this conversation a little bit earlier, so no woo woo here, yeah. but I, mine is a family that is not extraordinarily long lived. Um, my health is such that I will not live to be a hundred. I, I won't live to be 80. I probably won't live to be seven. So I started to face the reality at 55 that, you know, I've got my last dog or maybe this puppy I've got is my last dog and I probably shouldn't have even gotten her. And, and if my goal as a preservation breeder is to say that I will always be there for every single puppy that I produce, but I'm dead, how's that going to work out? And, and this is a thing that too many people do not take into consideration. And I wanted to be proactive. I wanted to do this while I still could. I had built a very, very recognizable and consistent family of dogs that I wanted to see carried forward because I believe they offered value to the German wire hair pointer breed as a whole. And so I started working with a couple different, actually three, really three different people at this point um, with a few others that are kind of out there on the fringes that will contribute going forward. Um, but primarily people who had acquired my dogs or people that I had given my dogs to. Um, my, my primary breeding program um, has been transferred to a young woman that used to work for me. She was an assistant when I was a handler when I lived in Nebraska. She now lives in Iowa. She has, I gave her... Um, a bitch where I had purposely gone out and sought a second bitch line to add to my, to my breeding program, I gave her that dog. And then I did an inbreeding that combined seven generations of my entire bitch line. First time I'd ever done a half brother, half sister breeding. I gave her the pick bitch from that. And when I say gave, I mean, gave, there was no money involved. I am giving you these dogs with the intentional purpose that you are going to carry this breeding program forward, that you and I are going to have conversations about what happens. And I'm going to give you the stud dogs that I have in frozen semen. And I'm going to give you that semen and I'm going to give you direction about where I think X, Y, and Z dogs should be bred. And we're going to continue to work together until the day I keel over and die. Right. So, so that is, that is a gift that I have and that I was given by Riley. Um, I have a couple other people that have my dogs that are breeding down from them. I just had two of them work together to do a co-bred litter where it was an uncle niece. It was a beautiful line breeding. It was hundred percent something that I would have done. I helped them. I graded the litter. I helped them place the puppies. I don't know. Right. So I am still very, very, very actively involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the Scotia Kennel and down from it, but I am not personally having 14 wire hair pointers running around like crazy people at eight weeks old in my house. Cause I just plain can't do it. Like physically I can't do it. Right. And I think that um, it's pretty amazing that when you take someone in like that, they then get to have your other contacts because you're bringing people together to probably work together. And people yep. might not have an opportunity to get to use some of those dogs or have access to some dogs when, and, and I really, I have to say this, and I'm going to probably say this a bunch more times as we go through. I think this is just a huge amount of selflessness and just setting ego aside because it's so hard for some people to not just say, we're done. Look, I'm closing everything down. And if it was something like all of a sudden at this time in your life, you discovered this horrible health problem and you had to, that's one thing, but to be moving forward and being proud of what you produced and where your kennel is, and you found the people. And I think that's like one of the big things is, is having access to the people that, you know, it is. but, but Vicki stop for a minute and understand. And, and, and let me share with you what I have learned because I haven't always been the world's greatest mentor. I mean, some of the people who bought one of my, you know, dogs from some of my first litters, 
I don't count as my best friends. <laughs> I don't count as my mentees. And they used to, you know, have raging fits because I wanted them to do something X, Y, Z. And I, I wasn't very good at my mentorship. I, I failed them as mentors, as a mentor. I failed them as mentees. And I mean, we could you know, talk about they were assholes or whatever, but that's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is I didn't do a good job. And so why? What do you think you didn't do good? <clears throat> I was too bossy. Um, there was a thing you I think it might have even been you that you posted um, that said that a mentorship is not a dictatorship. Was that you that posted? Yeah, that? yeah, absolutely. So, We've been talking uh, a lot about that lately. So, so funny story. One of these young people that I'm just telling you about that that had physically whelped this this uncle niece breeding sent me that and said, thank you for showing me how it should be done. Now, nice. if you go back to 1999 and that person, they didn't say thank you. They said, sign off my freaking dog after I showed it to its best in show. And did, I mean, you know, there's some bitterness that comes when you fail on both sides. Trust me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and failures on both sides. Um, but truly what I have learned is how to be a better mentor. But also and, in like you, when you get older, you also just learn how to be a better person. And I think well, I'm a better know, human than I was. Yeah, when I was 25. Right. I mean, and it's like, God. everybody changes. And, and I honestly don't think somebody, I'm not saying everybody, but I'm saying generally, you know, when we're younger is not is not when we're always the best of who we're gonna be, right? Well, I certainly was not, and I, I will not speak for anyone else, but I definitely was not. I, I had a real edge and a real temper and um, a real mouth and I, you know, I, I fail. And that's, you learn, you, you have to fail in order to grow. And so mm -hmm. all these people that are out here, oh my God, am I gonna, I'm like, okay, dude, 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 it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. There'll be a tomorrow, right? It, it's Do you gonna... feel like there's ever a right time? Like to, 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 for, I mean, I guess everybody's right time is a different time, right? When it's time to be like, it's I... different from person to person. And I came from, like, as you mentioned, I'm second generation. I had a lot of knowledge going into what I was doing. And I was willing to listen and learn from a lot of people. And I have found that the people who are the most successful are the people who are willing to do that. The people who want to do it all their own way and think they know everything at day one are generally the people who are not long-term successful. Right. They I agree. Flash in the pan success. And their first show dog might be a, you know, big, fancy, top winning, whatchamacallit. Um, but they can't replicate it. And right. so I think that um, putting your head down, putting your nose to the grindstone, doing the work, studying the pedigrees, talking to people, learning about your breed, going to every bloody national that you can go to if you have to sleep in a tent, doing all of those things, putting in the hard work. When I talk about eight generations, which is this, this breeding that's now on the ground, both in Colorado and Iowa, they're both eight generations. And I say to you that I have personally with my own eyeballs seen every single dog in that pedigree, in the show ring, in the field, and their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and siblings. And I've paid attention and I have done that since 1996 you can you can say that you're a dog breeder you can say that you're important you can get all kind of fancy ribbons but until you actually do the work you're just lucky right why is it so important that breeders who have the experience and actually 
the success in all the areas that you have, why is it important for those breeders to, to be willing to pass the torch? I mean, it seems obvious, but I want to hear you say, well, it. I want to hear no, gonna, like, I like mean, this is a big deal. This is all of these. It is a of big deal. Stuff. And I'm going to, I'm going to say a couple of things. Number one, I can go back to when I was um, just getting started in this breeding program and I trained dogs um, in the field with someone who's now incredibly famous in a very big mucky muck in the dog world. And I'm not going to name names because it would be inappropriate. And that person told me at the time that he had given up basically mentoring people because nobody ever listened. Nobody fucking listens, right? Nobody fucking listens to me, right? Mm -hmm. He had given up. He was tired of, of people not paying attention, not listening, not doing what he recommended. And I found that then, and I was very fortunate because this person taught me a lot, like a lot, a lot. Um, and I was really lucky to have had the time that I had. But I only got that time because I was willing to put in the time. I got that knowledge because I put in the effort. This isn't a one-way street. People aren't going to just give you this on a platter, right? It really requires someone to show that they care, that they're committed, that they're dedicated. And that's mm -hmm. going to take a minute. That isn't going to happen overnight. And, and I understand that there's a lot of people that are just bitter and, yeah. and they've burned and, and I get it. And they, I'm sure they were burned, but I'm just know that if you are willing to do the work and when I say burned, I mean that on both sides, I have been burned by people I was mentoring. I mentioned it slightly before uh, badly, like horrendously badly. Um, and I have been burned by people that were mentoring me and I'm still here. Right. And so my advocacy is not so much that we suck it up or get a thicker skin or all the things that you hear because right. nobody really wants to hear that. But what I am going to tell you is that dedication and passion are matched and if you're willing to be dedicated and passionate, someone will take you and they will raise you up. Mm -hmm. If you want to just be cool and have a fancy show dog and a lot of ribbons, you know, I, that's, that's great. That's a worthy goal. But you're probably not going to get the same level of mentorship that you might um, otherwise. Right. Because that, what pe it, it too totally hard? does it too hard. No, you're saying it exactly right. Cause the point is you're not just looking for somebody when you're, when you're, when you're handing over essentially a chunk of your heart and your life, my life. you're, so yeah, my, you're, you're not, yeah, I'm you're not looking you my life's work, my blood, my sweat, my tears, my money, my, crawling on the ground, sobbing, broken. If I'm going to give you that, that's not coming just because you're cute. Right. And it's not coming just because you want somebody to have a good show dog. It's because of the dedication to the breed and you choosing the person who you think is going to do right, not only by your kennel and the dogs you produce, but by the breed, by the sport, by the fancy, by, by right? Like, Yep. You know, and I think that that is, it's a hard, hard thing. And I, you know, we talk all the time about, Oh, why are purebred dogs dying? And you know, the old guard is mean. Well, no, I'm not mean, but I, I do have some requirements. I mean, listening to me is one of those requirements mm -hmm. because I actually know something. And I'm willing to listen to you and hear your thoughts, but I'm probably going to suggest that the depth and breadth of the experience that I have to bring to a question is um, worth considering. Right. Well, and that kind of brings me to my next, because the, a lot of 
you know, the whole mentorship is not a dictatorship as obviously has a lot to do with my coaching clients and stuff like that. And, you know, the, the people that I really feel are worthy and would be good and just haven't fallen in to mm -hmm. luck to have someone like you mentoring them, where sometimes people do end up with people who really are just about their kennel and mm -hmm. this breeding and that. And you kind of just said it there because I was going to say, well, how do you best support and teach someone and mentor them and want them to listen while you also want them to develop and grow right? It's like a fine line. And I think part of it is just relationships and personality types, right? You know, but and, being and like I said, I'm a better human than I was 30 years ago. I mean, I'm not yeah. going to lie to you. It's, it's a fact. Um, and there's lots of people that will attest to that. <laughs> um, but I, I think too that um, as we talk to people who are interested in growing our breed or someone who wants to buy our dog or, you know, whatever, hear them, hear what they have to say, hear what matters to them. Um, I, there's someone here that has just popped up um, that I think is a really great example. Um, although it might not be the same person. I don't know. Um, young woman who uh, bred to one in a, a stud dog that I bred. She didn't buy her foundation bitch for me. She has different breeding goals, but she had really great questions. And I spent hours and hours and hours and hours on her with messenger on the telephone. Blah, blah, blah. And um, I think that listening to what matters to those people helps you understand the people that come to you and ask questions. Is this someone I want to really kind of get behind? Or is uh -huh. this someone that I'm just going to kind of, help from a distance. Do you understand what I'm saying? And totally. That and I think part of it is like how someone brings it to you. Like I certainly, you know, with like, let's say training mentors that I've had, you know, I come to them. That's a little bit different because, you know, we're not talking about, they're not giving me like, <laughs> you know, their whole kennel and all this, but like, you know, I think that you consider the quality of the questions and if they make sense to you and if it's like, wow, that's a really freaking great question. You know, I'm so glad you asked that. Let's mm -hmm. have a conversation and talk about it instead mm -hmm. of just being like, oh, no, that's horse shit. Like, no, we're not going to do that. Or, you know, but really, like, even if you do think it's horse shit, like even if you did think right. something was dumb, at it, least it, being able to be like, let's a, talk about is, that. It's absolutely. Um, It is absolutely a process of learning how to be a good mentor. I believe it is also a process of learning how to be a good mentee. And you said it earlier, it's about relationship and a relationship building. This is no different than any other relationship. Um, in many cases, the people that I'm working with, I've spent more time with than I've had any of my four husbands. So I'm saying I <laughs> Um, it matters. And so putting time into those relationships, supporting those relationships, being willing to hear, being willing to listen, you know, being fair, right? It isn't fair to ask someone with um, a, 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 a limited budget to carry all the weight of whelping a litter, even though they maybe have the time and, and, and physical ability to do it, right? Mm -hmm. so, so fairness matters. And um, credit where credit is due matters. Those are things, you know, you and I have different ideas about dog training, but I always say firm, fair, and consistent, right? Mm -hmm. So I, when I say it, I mean it. If it's, it, it has to be fair to everybody and it has to be the same thing every time. Mm -hmm. that, that counts when we're talking about building relationships with mentees as well. Oh my God. It, it really does. Because I do feel like such a big thing that's hard is inconsistency. Like mm -hmm. I can't deal with that. Per, like me, I can't deal with it. If it's like back and forth or we don't know what's going to happen. Today, no, it, tomorrow, I love you. That just drives everybody crazy. Like what's the, yeah, point? it's really hard. You know what it reminds me of too? Like, I don't know if you saw it, but I interviewed, um, 
Sandra Pertari Hickson the other day, and we talked about her long relationship with Betty Ann. Betty Ann. With the, yeah. And I mean, it's like, I mean, I wanted to talk about that more. Like, God, that's so amazing that you've maintained that relationship for so long. Um, I mean, I just think, I think it's really lucky when you can find what you've found. But I think that there is that possibility out there for other people. They just have to be willing to, you know, be open and everybody, really consider it. There, there is a match for, for, for most everybody out there. And, you know, I have two or three people, everybody can have two or three people, right? Like it's a thing, but it is, it is a process and you have to, on both sides, put some work in. Um, so Mackenzie Ferguson here, uh, I thought had a really, really interesting yep. question. Um, great. That, yeah. That, that really is um, worth discussing. So generational differences and how it affects um, what putting in the work looks like. And so Mackenzie, I, I'm going to be straight up honest with you. I don't believe there is a whole lot of difference between putting in the work 50 years ago and putting in the work today. Putting in the work is still putting in the work. You might do it in a different way. So, for example, um, in 1996, when I was first getting started with this particular line of dogs, I called people on the telephone. I visited their home. I wrote letters back and forth. I have files and files and files of photos and letters from old time breeders. I went to their homes and I sat and I drank coffee with them at their tables or drinks with them at their tables or what have you. I went to the national field trial and I sat on a horse and I rode with them and talked to them about what we were seeing. I went to the dog show and I talked with them ringside about what they were seeing. You can do those same things today in a virtual way if you need to, but you still need to do the work. And I understand everybody, everybody is quite sure that their situation is worse than somebody else's situation. But I promise you, um, I didn't have any more money than y'all have. I figured it out. I figured out a way to do it. And, and that is, we all make priorities in life and, and choosing the priorities that we make. I make no judgment, zero judgment about where your priorities are, what you can and can't do. My um, gal that has taken on my breeding program is a special education teacher. And the wire hair pointer national is always in October. She almost can never go because she just started her school year and she can't be away for a week during the first month of school. And I feel terrible because this year is the only year for the next three years that it's going to be anywhere near her and I'm judging it. And so she can't show any of the dogs and I just feel terrible about that. But um, putting in the work means putting in the work and, and Mackenzie, I guess the, in specific answer to your question, how the generational differences affect it is that you have different ways of communication and different ways of onboarding that information. You know, pure dog talk podcasts weren't a thing, right? Um, things like show dog prep school or leading edge dog show Academy, all of these things were not a thing. Um, when I was coming up, I had to do it. If you will, old school, I had to read all the books all these books on my bookshelf. Now that's not to say y'all can't read a book, but I'm saying that there are ways that are more 21st century um, for people for whom that's an issue. And I don't, I don't begrudge people that at all. All I'm saying is passion matters and dedication matters. And that doesn't change with the um, format in which you, provide it. Does that make sense? Vicky? It does. But I have, a, I do have a question about this or like sort of an add on, but because like I got my first dachshund that I was going to show in 1995 and I got in, you know, with a group of people and it was like sort of, you know, just the people that were always at the dog shows, right? My mentors, my group. And it was like, I mean, we went to dachshund field trials and there were puppies there. There were always puppies there. 
There was no like, well, how about if they get parvo? It's like, no, you take your puppies to the field trial. We all put our hands on them. Mentors would pick you up out of your chair and drag you over and say, no, this is where you put your thumb to look at the shoulder. And then your finger, I mean, it was like, literally like, you're going to do that. And I actually loved that. I mean, mm -hmm. I love that so much. And when I went to um, the Lao Chen National a few years ago, I was like, can we all just go to someone's RV and like get all our dogs together and everybody go over them and talk about them? Like, I think that is so cool. And I just, I don't know. I don't see that as much. Maybe it's going on and I don't see it, but I'm not seeing like so, litters of puppies and x pens like you would see. You know what I mean? So, so here's my, and, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be very, um, um, specific about some of my word choices here okay because it, this is a thing um 21st century people who own dogs in more cases than it was when i was coming back up in the 80s and or even when you were coming out probably in the 90s right Dogs have become an extension of one's ego. And it's, totally. it is more difficult for fanciers who are new to the sport to hear critiques or criticism, positive or negative, of their dog because that dog is an extension of their own ego. And I do not believe that this is an exclusive I do not believe that this is every single person. I am not banging on kids or whatever generation. That's not the point. It, it, it is the same from, from 20 to 60. It is an era in which um, our self-worth is wrapped up rather than being able to more objectively analyze the dogs in front of us, our self-worth has become more wrapped up in that. Right. And, and that is where I see so much of the Sturm und Drang. Yes, the Sturm und Drang, right? The, the big drama mm -hmm. around dog shows is that someone... Um, of an older era will make an offhand remark, not meaning it in a negative way that is heard and processed by someone whose entire self-worth and value is wrapped up in this dog in a very, very negative way. And this person over here that said it is like, Wah. yeah. And this person over here is like, Wah. and, and I think both of them are maybe a little on the edges, right? Like mm -hmm. be a little more aware of how you say what you say. That's not that hard, right? right? And maybe be a little more aware of how you hear what you hear. Mm -hmm. and, and there's there's a meeting in the middle there that doesn't require anyone to be vilified. Right. That makes sense to me. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. But I do think like um, when I was talking about early mentors for me, I mean... There were some for sure that were like kind of harsh and hardcore, but really like my first mentor that comes to mind was a dachshund breeder, um, Sharon Carr. And mm -hmm. she, and I was just talking to somebody about this the other day, we were talking about mentors and, and she, I would say, well, what do you think if I bred her to him? And mm -hmm. she might say something like, well, it's not probably what I would do, mm -hmm. but I'm in a different place in my breeding program than you're in with your, but it, it always I felt like okay, she's not telling me I can't do it. She's not saying she won't love me right. if I do do it. I did it. And right. she was right. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Like, like right. you know what I mean? Like, but she let me right. do that. And she let me learn, you know, to be able to make their own decisions and their own choices. And Mackenzie um, came back with a, a really interesting clarification and, and talking about um, learning styles and communication and information accessing and, and you are so on point with this, Mackenzie, like a hundred percent on point with it because I am that old school person. And I just had somebody today, they wanted to call me up and talk on the telephone. That is a hundred percent how we like to communicate. We are happiest, those of us old fogies in that world. And I had to 
check myself with the um, gal who was both of the gals that are doing these two litters that we just had, because I want to call them on the telephone and they're irritated. Oh. <laughs> yeah. like, me. I'm doing things. And so I text me, to, just text me. Right. <laughs> I'm like, no, this is not a text conversation. This is much more depth and, and continuity and clarity that I can do on text. You know, and so, yes, Mackenzie, you are a hundred percent on point. <laughs> and even with my kids that call me mom, they're irritated with me because I want to call them and talk to them on the telephone. Yeah. And so it, it is a hundred percent a thing. And I think it goes back to, and I'm going to make this argument and y'all can laugh at me all you want, but my basic argument is always going to be mutual respect. Like if I try to have some respect and say, Hey, I know you don't really want to talk to me on the phone. Is there a time that would be okay to talk? Right. Mm -hmm. And text that to them, then people will answer me. And if they have some respect for my desire to like spend an hour hashing through a particular topic, they will gracefully give me an hour when they don't probably have it. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's called mutual respect. I know it's sort of old fashioned and out of date, not very au courant these days. Um, but it's a thing. And it goes I'm going to ask you this question time. because it just popped back into my head and it fell out a while ago. When, when I talk about when I was having these first show dogs and sometimes I was just going to shows, I even went to a national, like way before I got a show dachshund. Um, I mean, a lot of the people, and I, I don't want to say this in a way to offend anybody. I certainly don't want to say it in a way that it offends you, but it was like, they didn't care about anything but breed, right? Like they didn't care that sometimes they, they were like, oh, I don't even worry about the group. I mean, they were like hardcore. I'm a breeder. And I feel like. I think that's kind of a doctrine is... thing though. I'm going to say to you, that is kind <laughs> of a doctrine thing. And that, that is in my experience specific to certain breeds. Right. Like I, I grew up and Clumbers, we went to the group, damn it, no matter what, even if you went with your class dog, because you wanted people to see your dogs. So right. there are breed cultures that are specific. So continue on. But I will say, I do think that is more of a, a, a specific thing to dogs and people. But imagine how that affects not anymore so much me, but like in the beginning, that wasn't something I was taught for that to be important, right? So it's like, do you feel that part of this like intense wanting to win and intent, like like you were saying, the dog being so much, like almost a part of a person, that's how they value themselves. That's how they value their ego. Do you think that how competitive it's gotten in terms of like bigger, you know, bigger, 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 you know what I mean? Because I mean, there's an entire, Vicki, there's an entire conversation to be had. And, and I think you've had it in parts. I've had it in parts. There's a whole entire conversation to be had about too many dog shows, too much watering down of the dog show environment, too much emphasis on group and best in show placements. Um, I know personally know people who will tell you that the ranking systems that came into place in the sixties were the ruination of dog shows. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't, I have been known to become caught up in, <laughs> in the, the sort of, you know, it was always better in the old days. There are things that are better now. Um, and there are things that are not better. Um, what I, what I can do, what I believe you and I can do is to help people acquire a deeper, less surface, more nuanced understanding of what confirmation, animal husbandry, um, dog breeding, dog confirmation presentation, all the things, what those mean in the long run. And, and our society today isn't like it was 30 years ago or 40 years ago. There's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of things to do with your day than spend the day at a dog show. And so the people who are doing this now are real super focused on that. And, and that's great. My goal is to encourage them to dig deeper into that focus and to 
acquire a level of knowledge and a level of appreciation and understanding and caring and passion and all those things to go beyond the pretty suit running in left-handed circles, getting a pretty ribbon. And, you know, one thing that I'm always trying to remind people and tell people and sort of like instill in people that is like, you know, this is like a, the life, you know what I mean? Like it, it statistically, if you are a normal person showing dogs, you're going to lose more than you win. And so you have to just love going and doing the thing and be in there with your friends. And this is what I do with my dog. You know, like I have millions of friends who do lots of dog sports. I mean, mm -hmm. dog sports that you don't have to w beat other dogs. You are right. competing against yourself. Um, right. And so if the dog just does it right, for sure, he's, right. you know, so, and and I I'm, think still here. I'm still here but doing I, confirmation. Because I think that's a really, really, really important point that is frequently glossed over. So in the day, right, back in the day, 80s 70s 80s sort of the the if they mm. if you will the heyday of purebred dogs in this modern era confirmation regular obedience and field trials not hunt test field trials that's what you and had those were what you had it was all competition period there was nothing that was not competitive and over the course of the last 30 and 40 years, we have seen a booming growth of non-competitive sports. And I think those are amazing. And I want the people who are participating in them to love them. And then if they find they have a slightly competitive edge to come join us in the competitive sports, right? That's all. I do not... Um, I do not choose to glorify one over the other. Um, I understand that in a, in a world in which the dog is part of my ego, competition is hard, right? And non-competitive events where you can do the thing and have fun and do the stuff and you have a whole community of that, that's amazing. I want all those people to do all those things because they love purebred dogs and that is what matters. And can a few of them, a percentage of them, can we peel them off and do competitive things? Great. Cool. I mean, how many confirmation, big time, long time breeders do you know that every single one of them started with a purebred dog that they took to obedience class? Correct. I have 600 episodes, a third of which are interviews with the most famous handlers and judges in the world. And 75% of those started just that way. And so I, I love the gateway drugs. 100% love that. Um, and I think in today's society where, where time is precious, um, people think about things differently. It's great. It's fabulous. I am so happy for every single person that puts a trick title or a CGC or a, a rally novice, whatever, do something, have a purebred dog and want to do something with it. it yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Let's um, I want to tip on a couple of these questions real quick. So mm -hmm. um, Barbara said, I am new six years and very much have the impression that it is inappropriate to comment on critique or question anyone else's dogs. Yet it sounds like a lot more back and forth along those lines used to happen more. Yes. Part of it is because we asked and part of it is because we were told. <laughs> part of it, right? And part of it, and, and again, I, I really hate when we get into these things, you know, millennials versus Generation X or whatever the hell, like, it's, it's not a thing. But realistically, back then, if someone, if you brought a dog into the ring and said it wasn't show quality, you would not be offended and post that all over Facebook. Today. So you didn't, and there wasn't Facebook. <laughs> right. So I blame social media for 90% of it, maybe 95. Um, yeah. Of, so, of the but, problems but, in the world, baby. <laughs> yeah. No, no, not, not, not joking. I, yeah. I that's a fact. Um, I believe that um, 
social media has has done a lot of positive things, but the, I sincerely believe that the negative outweighs the positive, particularly in the world of dog book. Um, it gives too many people the opportunity to um, jack their jaws and talk about things they don't actually know anything about and complain about things that they don't understand and and generally be made to feel really popular by being sad about a situation. That's not an okay thing to do, y'all. Um, I'm just saying, if you have a real and actual and serious um, situation with a judge or a person or a whatever, I promise you on a stack of you name it, encyclopedias to Bibles, whatever makes you happy. I promise you, if you handle it privately, it's going to go a lot better. That's some advice from an old lady. So take it and do with it as you please. Um, Macy said, uh, I'm just going to kind of, she, yep, she no has, problem. I know we're running towards the end. Um, she does all kinds of stuff with her Papillon stock diving agility, barn hunt, fast cat. She entered her first two confirmation shows with two girls at a small local show where we have lots of connections. Um, what advice do you have for someone just getting started looking to own or handle when they do not have the big connection in the confirmation world, how big of a role does politics connections and the name play in placements and overall, oh, this is like a whole, this is actually another this is a whole topic. We can do an entire topic <laughs> on this one, Macy. So props for you for bringing it up, but here's what I'm going to say. And again, this may not be, this may be what is called on um, social media an unpopular opinion, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. I am a judge. I judge dogs. I know other dog judges who judge dogs and I know other dog judges who don't. I would say that of the people who don't, it's perhaps less than 5%. Everyone I know in the judging community is trying their best. Some of them perhaps are not as gifted as others. Some of them haven't had as much experience. Some of them are tired. You pick a thing. But 95% of the people I know in the ranks of the judging corner, it may be more than that, are trying their very best. And politics, particularly in classes or at the winner's dog, winner's bitch level, outside of national specialties, it's not a thing. What is a thing is skill, presentation, quality of the animal, quality oh of the grooming and the presentation. And I will promise you that if I have spent 25 years of my life showing 10 to 20 dogs a day, four to five days a week in anywhere from five to 10 different breeds, if I'm not able to more successfully present my exhibit than you are at your very first dog show, then I should be fired. I was a professional handler for 25 years. I worked very hard at my craft and the people who do it for a living also work very hard at their craft. You'll also be competing against owner handlers who have been doing it for anywhere from 25 to 50 years. It's okay. It is, it can feel very daunting. It can feel overwhelming. But if you go into it with an attitude of wanting to learn, wanting to succeed, and wanting to get more from what you put in each day, you'll be fine. Will you win the first day? Maybe, maybe not. Will you be able to win down the road? 100%. And um, politics, quote unquote, is nothing. It really is not a thing. Skill is a thing. I want to say too, because, you know, I coach a lot of people and a lot of times, you know, it comes up a lot. Well, you know, they, I think that they're just looking for handlers or no. And it's like, what I have to remind people of is that handlers usually present dogs better. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, it's not necessarily like, and it's, I have and it's gone not, to a dog show and seen a dog I, with an owner my handler. Point is and I should, right? You don't go course. to a brain surgeon to fix your carburetor. 
Right, right. And it's like, and that's a tumor in your head. But I think it's like people also, and this probably come, you know, rolls off the worth thing is that it's like, sometimes there's like this obsession for trying to figure out why, you know, why didn't my dog win? And, and a lot of times the answer is the, either the, the judge. Dog. Yeah. The other, the judge liked the other dog, but it also could be presentation. And it also could be like, you need to keep doing it. If you're going to get better at it. Like mm-hmm. I've seen dogs shown by a handler the day after they were shown by an owner and not know it was the same dog. Be like, Oh, oh I didn't God. see that one here yesterday. Who's that? And it's like, Oh, it was here yesterday. It doesn't look like the same animal. And, and so, I mean, Vicki, this is another one of those areas where you and I come at it from a different perspective. I did this for a living and, and there's a lot of people who do it for a living. And I was very careful. I refused to take, I didn't take gas money dogs. I didn't have ugly, you know, like if I brought a dog, it was a quality animal Yeah, and I believed in it. And it may not be to a judge's type or it may be whatever, or maybe my grooming wasn't a hundred percent to par, or, you know, whatever it was on the day. Right. But if you come with a quality dog that is properly trained and properly conditioned and it's the best dog on the day, 95% of the judges are going to find it. I but that means you have to bring it properly trained, properly conditioned, which means grooming, muscle tone, muscle tone. You cannot drag a dog off the couch that has never done anything other than lie on the couch and watch Netflix and eat popcorn with you and expect that you're going to beat a dog that's been on the treadmill for half an hour to 45 minutes every single day, its entire adult life. Like you're not going to win. Right. There are some real serious facts here. And so you can choose to be mad or you can choose to do better and win. Right. Those are, exactly. those are well, I just don't, I mean, my point is, I just, I don't think it's political most of the time. Not, I think that it's, it's yeah, you know, especially at the class level. Percent of the time, it is not political. Um, two more points I want to make. The first one is I have interviewed more than one people who own or handle and have won best in shows, not owner handler, mm-hmm. best in shows, regular best in shows. So mm-hmm. those people many times are just as much a force to be reckoned with, um, 100%. you know, and, and, I've and tried, yeah, a million, part of it is, a million of those people. Um, and, 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 you know, and part of it truly is that it's like, you know, do the judge, do judges know them? Yeah, because they always bring them dogs that they like. I mean, you when you see the person and they have a type and they because like that you type. Pay attention to what the judge likes and you know what the judge likes and you have the dog to bring that judge. Right. That's part of the knowledge is knowing and watching. And if I've shown a Chihuahua, an Akita, an Irish Wolfhound, a wire hair pointer, an allotion to the same judge over the course of a three day weekend, I'm going to have a pretty good sense of what they like because I'm not focused on, did I win or lose? I'm focused on what did the judge want? What did they mm-hmm. put up? What are the commonalities? Is Are they a head hunter? Are they a, are they a tooth fairy? Are they a movement freak? Are they all about top lines? Are they all about silhouette? Yeah. You can learn that if you watch and watch without angst. Yeah, we, we, you watch with the intent to learn. You watch, it, it, you could make a cool thing. Out. My final thing I want to say is that for anybody who has an issue or feels like, oh, judges are just blah, blah, blah. I mean, listen to some of Pure Dog Talk's judges interviews. Michael Canalizo is my favorite one, literally, like goosebumps the whole time. It, 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 and and there's a lot of them. But I do think that listening but to that- entire just- album, it's called The Interviews. Go, go down, it's like a buck 99. Go download the album and listen to every one of the interviews. Do not read Dog Show Judges Report Card. It's garbage and sour grapes and dumb. Listen to the judges talk their own words from their own mouth. And that will teach you more than you will ever get anywhere else. Well, and I just think it really gives you an, like, I I can't remember the judge's name. I feel so bad. It was something Reynolds. Jim Reynolds. Yeah. And I remember him saying, you know, 
when I'm in the ring with that dog, like that's my dog for those two minutes. Two minutes. That is my dog. That is my favorite interview. And that's how I really. Oh my god! But it was just so poignant. It brought tears to my eyes. He was saying, "I freaking love dogs." But it's real. I'm going to tell you when I'm in the ring for that two minutes. That's my dog. Yeah. It's the thing. I'm I so actually, glad it's like, like one of your favorite interviews because that yeah, was one of my Jim favorite too. Jim is one of my very, very favorite people in the world. hundred percent. Well, it was just so cool to hear him be like, to hear someone that you might think is like hoity toity and out of reach because he's a big fancy judge, but here he is going, I can't believe I get to like do dogs every day. You know what I mean? And so I just think it can give people a real insight into you know, what they're looking for and why they, you know, where they came from too, you know, listening 100%. to them. That's the whole yeah. point. Judges were not hatched for Megs, y'all. I promise. They started the same place you are today. Veronica has a really good question. I wanted to answer it super fast. Um, don't we learn more about dogs across the country that we used to not be able to see or consider using? <laughs> that is one of the ways. And I said very clearly, social media has its benefits. Um, yeah. That is one of the things, although I will tell you once upon a time at a national long ago and far away, um, we were talking about the difference that social media had made on nationals and we made the comment. There's a group of us together talking old time wire hair pointer people and that nationals just weren't as exciting anymore because now you've seen all the dogs on Facebook. There's no surprises. There's no, Oh my God. What's that that makes your blood tingle because everything's been promoted all over hell and creation on social media. And so the pros and cons. So yes, Veronica, hundred um, percent um, and around the world, I think social media has brought the dog breed, made the dog breeding world into one small place. And I think that is to the, to the benefit of many breeds, but I admit to being old school enough that I just love to have a surprise at the national. I'm going to tell you something that uh, recently someone contacted me to breed to my stud dog. And um, this is someone who's been in the breed for a long time. I know her. And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, so we started talking. She, someone else had to message me to give me her phone number and say, can you call her? And I was like, of course. So I phone her up and you know, she says, how much is a stud fee? And I tell her and I say, but I'm also like totally open to a puppy. She was like, oh my God, I'm so happy. You are. I love that. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I, it's almost like taboo to mention it anymore, but I love that. Like now I'm working with this person. She doesn't do text. She doesn't do email. You talk to her on the phone or you drive into the mountains to her kennel where she has a boarding kennel. And that's where I go to pick up a bitch or to go look at the litter of puppies. But it was just like, it's really refreshing and cool. Cause it's like, that's what I was looking for. I was looking for somebody who like, like I went up there and me and a, a handler friend, Marge, who kind of put us together again, we all went out to lunch and it was just like talking about dogs. Like that's where really where it's at you know i think that's so cool so it is hard for me because i'm like oh i i don't like to do the phone but i have to do that because that's how she deals and it's actually been really fun for me because i'm not texting her all the time because i call her when we have something important to discuss right. you know so right. right um okay we should probably wrap it up we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours i, I think this is this is one of those topics we could go on forever but i know people have lives to get to so um congratulations on finding people that you feel you can trust and that are people that you are willing to invest in and that this gets to keep going on that you're what I you am, built i am you incredibly know. blessed and i know i am and they do. They are too, Laura. They are too. And I'm sure they know it. I think they know it. So um, any final thoughts? Um, it's not all about you. It really is about the breed. I guess that, I mean, I don't really have a better, you know, I'm not, I, I, I do better when I'm writing and crafting, but, but I really think that that is, you know, AKC has this new um, preservation semen bank right? Where people can donate frozen semen from their dogs for use for future oh. treatments. Um, there's That's a cool. 
<laughs> Sweet. Um, <clears throat> and it's for all breeds. It was started, the, the theory was started by the Otter Hound Club and is now an AKC initiative for all parent clubs to take on. And I hear all the time, oh, I would never do that because so-and-so would get some of it and they'd breed it wrong. That's not the point. Right. Right. The point right. Preservation breeding is preserving genetics. And sometimes people are going to do things that you would never in a million years dream of doing. And, and, you know, maybe they work out, maybe it's a flop, but that's that person's to take on. And mm -hmm. if you're not going to use the semen, donating it to the preservation semen bank is another one of the things that we can do as long time sort of heritage, preservation, conservation, whatever term you want to put on it, breeders who want to support the future. It's another way that we can think about doing that. Very cool. You guys, please uh, check out Pure Dog Talk. I know everybody does already anyways. Everybody knows about Pure Dog Talk. We all listen to it. We all love it. <laughs> um, and uh, Laura, thank you so much. This was such a good talk. I hope you write more about it. I hope you talk more about it. Um, you know, it's really, it's important and it's so good. And I'm so happy for these women that you're working with. It's just, it's all, it's the best of what all this can be. It really is. It, is. it really is. So, and as I said, I just, I consider myself incredibly blessed. So you are. And, but like I said, so are they, you guys, everybody, thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. And you will be able to find say. this. Yep. It'll live on um, this Facebook page. It'll go on both of our YouTube channels and it'll go on both of our podcasts, I think too. So yep. thank you everybody for watching and have a great rest of your night.